Last time, uh, in the last video lecture, we went over um, some of the very basic uh, observations of seismic waves. Uh, I showed you a bunch of calculations of seismic waves in the, um, uh, in the mode of looking for uh, earthquake hazards and uh, creating earthquakes in the computer to see how they would propagate through the complex geology of Nevada. And um, we saw that um, some of the, the principal uh, uh, observations of seismic waves are based on their, uh, their timing and uh, uh, their, when waves arrive, how they're delayed, how they're advanced, um, and uh, the timing depends on the velocity property of rocks, which is related to uh, density and uh, especially to uh, the elastic moduli uh, of the rocks, uh, things such as incompressibility and shear modulus. Um, this time we're going to look at uh, several more properties of uh, seismic waves uh, a little bit more quickly. And we're also going to take a look at um, uh, how we measure seismic waves, uh, the detectors uh, that we use to, uh, uh, to characterize uh, seismic waves and decide uh, you know, how fast they're moving, what their wavelength is. Uh, if you remember, uh, V equals F lambda was the most important uh, mathematical relationship you should remember from last time. And now we're going to uh, uh, see also how we're going to um, induce seismic waves in uh, exploration surveys and how we're going to measure them. Just a little preview of that. Um, after this lecture, we'll be able to get in a specific technique called seismic refraction Okay, to um, uh, start to learn about the Earth from uh, seismic surveys. It'll be our first uh, survey technique in this class. So the other thing we can uh, characterize uh, uh, fairly directly about seismic waves is their amplitudes. All right, and um, the reason uh, we care about amplitudes is that uh, although we're mostly trying to uh, derive that velocity property, and that we do by by timing the arrival of seismic waves, we can only see those arrivals if they have enough energy, if they have a high enough amplitude to stand up above the, uh, the noise level, the wind, the people walking around, other things, the traffic. Um, uh, all of those uh, create seismic waves of their own, and we can only see our active source, uh, the source we want to see that we're trying to time um, the uh, arrivals of the seismic waves that our source induces. Uh, we can only see that if, if the waves have enough amplitude. Now, seismic waves lose amplitude as they uh, spread, okay, as they uh, propagate. And they do that through a uh, process called uh, spherical spreading. All right, so you see here uh, um, in this diagram, we have a cross section, which you can tell it's a cross section because I have these axes x and z, where z is depth. Okay, if, I was, if this was a map, I might label it uh, easting and northing or uh, x and y. And here we have a source of seismic energy. Maybe this is a, an exploration blast near the surface. And the wave fronts propagate uh, circularly away from that, at least if the velocity property is relatively constant. And so we uh, have two different uh, two detectors uh, that are measuring the seismic wave and its amplitude at two different distances. So there's detector 1 and detector 2. And uh, at detector 1, we get amplitude 1, A1. And at detector 2, we measure amplitude 2, A2. And this detector 1 sees uh, the wave here as this uh, small circle uh, at uh, a radius R1 from the, uh, from the source. And uh, detector 2 sees amplitude 2 at a radius R2. All right. Now the energy of the, the wave is distributed over the surface area of the spherical wave front. You know, in a in a three dimensional Earth, so the area is uh, four pi times r squared. Okay, just the area of a of a sphere, and um, and you know, if if of course what you're seeing here are hemispheres, but if I divide this by two, you can see it doesn't make any difference. The ratio of the energy seen at um, at two at detector two over the energy seen at detector one. Okay. Uh, is uh, that thus four pi 
r1 squared divided by 4 pi r2 squared. Okay. Um, now there's, uh, uh, of course, uh, if r1 is um, um, is zero, right? If we are looking right at the uh, right at the source itself, then uh, um, we have a problem because uh, you know the ratio in that case is is zero, right? Um, so we have to uh, observe the waves, you know, at least a wavelength or two away from the source. Okay, that's uh, what's necessary for this uh, kind of simple relationship to hold up. So um, uh, we can cancel out the fours, we can cancel out the pies, and we basically have uh, uh, the ratio of r1 divided by r2 uh, squared. Okay. Uh, now uh, amplitude, you know, the uh, the measurement we make of the amplitude of the seismic waves, uh, you know, the uh, voltage we get out of the the, si the, the seismic instrument, or the uh, the number of electronic counts that it uh, records, is uh, is equal to the square root of energy. Okay, or at least it's proportional to the square root of energy, if you remember from physics, right? So energy is conserved, so it's spread out over the uh, um, over the uh, uh, the sphere. Okay. And the energy uh, is the ratio, the inverse ratio of the distances squared. All right. Now amplitude is the square root of energy, so um, we have uh, 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 <coughs> amplitude square amplitude at two divided by the amplitude at one is just going to be r one over r two. So that's why we say that at some distance r, the amplitude is proportional to one over r. All right. What does this say? Well, it says that the uh, the amplitude of the waves is going to is going to fall, but not too fast. Okay, if the amplitude of the waves fell as one over r squared, you know, then we we would have a really hard time observing our seismic waves uh, uh, anywhere away from the source. All right, and we would need really big sources to do seismic surveys. But it's just one over r, and so that means that you know we have some hope. That with practical sources that aren't too expensive to field, and practical instrumentation that doesn't have to be incredibly sensitive, you know, like an observatory seismograph that costs hundred thousand dollars and uh, fifty thousand dollars a year to maintain, um, we'll be able to see things like reflections and uh, refractions and direct waves that have that have not propagated too far. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's the simple geometric spreading. Of the spherical wave front, all right. Uh, seismic waves also lose energy to absorption. Okay, uh, basically uh, the the uh, the little tiny bit of shaking that the waves undergo, uh, some of it gets some proportion of it gets co converted to heat during each vibration cycle. Okay, so the energy is the initial energy E zero times this uh, uh, exponential factor. And uh, so it's e to the minus uh, an exponent. In the exponent, we've got a, a constant, uh, which is empirical. Uh, notice on the um, uh, on the numerator of the exponent. Okay, it's a negative exponent, but in the numerator of it, we have distance. All right. So uh, as distance goes up, the exponent becomes more negative, and the energy decreases. That makes sense. Okay. Also, there's f, the frequency. Okay. Um, as uh, frequency goes up, you know, to travel the same the same distance, there's more cycles. Okay, and there's a proportional, you know, maybe one percent of the energy is lost to heat during each vibration cycle. Okay, so uh, the higher the frequency, you know, the frequency goes up. It's uh, on the numerator of the uh, of the negative exponent, and the energy goes down. Okay, um, what's in the uh, denominator? V well, this is the velocity property of the rock. Okay, whichever wave we're looking at, you know, S wave or uh, or P wave, uh, we look at the S wave or P wave velocity. All right. Uh, now notice that um, uh, velocity is in the denominator of a negative exponent. So this means that as velocity goes up, okay, that means the wavelength goes up. If you remember V equals F lambda, and thus uh, there are fewer cycles. You know, even at the same frequency. If the velocity is up, the, there are fewer cycles per uh, uh, per uh, distance, so um, uh, there's less energy loss. Okay, so the energy is a little bit greater at higher velocities. All right, and then there's this Q factor. That's a 
uh, quality factor. It's uh, not uh, the same as a uh, uh, geological engineering rock mass quality factor. This is the seismological Q. Um, I'm sure they're related, but I, I can't reference the experimental work to, uh, uh, to look at that relationship. Um, don't know what it is. The, uh, the, but the Q factor is well known seismologically for uh, many different materials. And, um, uh, and you can see it's uh, called the quality factor because as Q goes up, being in the denominator of a negative exponential, it's, um, as Q goes up, then the amount of energy retained goes up. All right. Now the problem here is that for for our work in uh, the you know the shallow geophysics of the of the Great Basin, you know we have these low velocity uh, alluviums that we're trying to trying to image through, and uh, uh, we're trying to get a lot of details. So we're using high frequencies, but we have low velocities, and um, so our you know just the waves we need for uh, the definition that we want to get, and I'll, I'll talk about seismic resolution later on. Um, those waves lose energy the fastest. Okay. Also, turns out that alluvium has uh, a low uh, quality factor Q. So, uh, just another thing that's uh, you know the deck is stacked against us, and we have to work very hard uh, because of absorption to uh, uh, to image uh, to see those reflections, to see those refractions through uh, um, uh, through through uh, the kind of materials that we're going to be trying it at. All right. Uh, let's look at some example values of the quality factor. That you know, Q is another rock property, just like velocity or density. Okay. Dry sand, very low, ten to fifty. I've seen it as low as five. Um, alluvium, as I said, uh, you know, it's uh, fairly low, twenty to two hundred. Sedimentary rock, you know, depending on how indurated it is, um, it's uh, fifty to uh, uh, one thousand. And an igneous rock is, you know, usually up in the thousands. Okay, uh, can be low if the rock is faulted and fractured, but uh, uh, it's uh, usually uh, quite high. So, you know, when we're uh, in areas uh, like I've surveyed on the Colorado Plateau, uh, in um, Canyonlands National Park, it's sedimentary rock. The Q was fairly high, and uh, you know, we could see even relatively small sources uh, many kilometers away. But in uh, you know, say at the top of Sand Mountain, you know we're looking at a quality factor probably as low as five, and uh, it's hard to see anything. Uh, you know, even a fairly large source, hard to see it even several meters away. Uh, at least at high frequency. Okay, so high frequencies and shear waves die out very fast in surficial materials. Okay, now why why do shear waves die out very fast? Remember. The shear wave velocity is lower than the P wave velocity. So, again, you know, you use the right velocity for the kind of wave you're looking at, and the V is 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 there, and and taking the velocity lower gives you less energy retained. Okay, so uh, you know, high resolution shear wave um, uh, experiments are also quite difficult. Um, now. Uh, in this class, we're going to avoid talking about nonlinear effects. If you've taken earthquake engineering, uh, you know that when the amplitude of a seismic wave becomes very large, you know when the strains are on the order of ten to the minus two instead of ten to the minus six, okay, um, then the absorption increases drastically. Okay, ten to the minus one, you know, uh, it's really all nonlinear. Uh, you know, ten to the zero, uh, it, you know. Nonlinearity is is king. Um, so uh, uh, you know these nonlinear effects kick in uh, for very uh, large uh, 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 seismic wave amplitudes. Uh, so during earthquakes and also even our our pitiful little uh, uh, sledgehammer sources. You know uh, there are um, um, uh, you know, we do get high amplitudes. You know, strains of, of ten to the minus one, we get that uh, right near our energy sources. You know, as you can imagine, when you hit the ground with a hammer, you deform the ground. Okay, that's a lot of nonlinear absorption. Okay, uh, you can you can crack the rocks. Okay, and um, so uh, another example of this is is uh, using explosions for seismic sources. Okay. Uh, you might uh, try to pack your charge, uh, you know, all at the bottom of the borehole, 
to have a, a, a single point source, which is easy to treat mathematically. And you know, rather than uh, say uh, a, a, a ripple fired, uh, uh, well, and, and I don't know anything about uh, mining uh, uh, practices these days, but uh, I knew I knew, do know that um, you know when they lay out uh, several hundred boreholes and they shoot them all at once, they don't go off simultaneously. Uh, they uh, they go off kind of in in series as a wave, you know, moving down the mine bench. Um, so um, you know that's a that's a as an exploration source, a, a mine explosion is uh, problematic because it's not all going off at the same place in the same time, and it adds a lot of complexity to the uh, to the waveforms. At least at you know when you're, and you can see that complexity when you're recording, uh, you know, very close to the mine. Um, so uh, you know, often in exploration, we try to uh, put our explosives in a single, you know, a single pile, a single point, you know, right at uh, the bottom of the hole. Okay, and and here's the problem. Okay, uh, you know, because uh, there's so much energy lost in breaking rock, of course, right around the explosive mass. Okay, uh, which you geological engineers should be quite familiar with. Um, the energy is really the, the seismic energy that's yielded. I mean, we're not talking about heat energy here. We're not talking about um, uh, you know ninety five percent of the energy from the explosion is going to go into breaking rock and hot gas and raising the temperature and all of that sort of thing. Um, uh, but uh, the E here, that's the energy that's yielded into seismic waves that we can record. Okay, and the energy into seismic waves E here is proportional. That's what this Bizarre symbol means here. That's supposed to be like an alpha proportionality symbol. Okay, um, it's the third root of the mass of explosives. Okay, so just to illustrate, all right, at the bottom of, of one hole here, we have uh, one pound of uh, of anfo or dynamite, and um, so uh, the mass is uh, one. The energy is is basically one. Okay, uh, whatever units I'm using. Okay, I'm not telling you. Uh, then uh, we, uh, we 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 load it up. We we put in eight pounds of, of dynamite. Okay, so the mass is eight, right? Eight times one. All right, but the third root of eight is two. So, you know, even though we uh, we put in way more explosives, okay, uh, and that costs you know eight times as much at least, probably more. All right, then we only get a you know our seismic waves are only only get twice as much energy. In fact, uh, and since amplitude is the square root of energy, you know there's only 140 uh, percent. There's only 140 uh, percent uh, of the energy we had of the amplitude we had before. Okay, much easier to um, you know have the the drill rig uh, uh, on site and uh, drill in your seismic uh, shot holes. Um, if you want to double the energy, okay, you drill two holes and you put one pound at the bottom of each. You shoot them simultaneously. Okay. And you get uh, uh, you have twice only twice the mass of explosive, and since these two are not interfering with each other, they're you know outside the range of breaking rock. You know they're at least six feet away from each other, right? So one pound blast is not going to break ro break rock, uh, you know, more than a meter away. Um, so uh, uh, this uh, this doesn't apply. Then you just get to add them up, and your energy is then two. So putting all, all, you know, more energy all at one place just produces more heat and breaks more rock, and you're better off distributing your energy out over, uh, uh, over space. And also, as you'll see uh, when we talk about reflection sources, uh, it's good to distribute energy over time. Okay. I uh, want to want to say a few words about uh, shear waves. Okay. Um, now uh, here's a little illustration. Uh, we're looking at you know down at a map view of a, a line of particles, okay. And um, these open circles are the normal positions of the particle. And then during the passage of a shear pulse, the particles are displaced to these filled in these small dots. And the small dots are um, the uh, the positions during uh, uh, passage of the pulse. There's the uh, you can see the the positions form this wave again, and again in in, in 455 you can discover why uh, waves tend to be this uh, sinusoidal shape, you know, wave shape, right? Um, and uh, uh, so there's this wavelength, okay, 
and there's the direction of wave propagation. You know, this is going to move on, uh, and the wave is going to shake these particles here. The displacement is is uh, the critical thing here. As for shear waves, the displacement of the particle, um, you know, the direction of shaking is perpendicular, normal to the direction of wave propagation. Okay, so that's the that's what really defines a shear wave. And you know it can be normal in two different ways to the direction of propagation. Okay, so here's a uh, uh, a 3D particle motion diagram. We have a so you know here's three sources of uh, of seismic energy at the surface. Okay, so we hit the ground down. We we uh, we make a, a P wave which bounces off this reflector here and then and then continues and maybe we record it somewhere else on the surface. And the P wave is shaking in the direction of propagation. Okay. Um, now the uh, what's called the S V wave is shaking, you know, perpendicular to the direction of propagation and in the vertical plane. Okay. And there's that little uh, perpendicularity symbol there. Okay. So it's a little bit vertical, which is why it's called an S V wave. Now we rotate this around. We keep it. We keep it perpendicular to the direction of propagation. But we have the other component here, and the shaking is perfectly horizontal. All right, still perpendicular to the direction of propagation, but perfectly horizontal. Okay, and that's uh, called an SH wave for horizontal shear wave. Okay, horizontally polarized shear wave. This is a partly vertically polarized shear wave. You can see it's also polarized in what you might call the radial direction, the the direction of the wave propagation. Okay. Uh, now, shear waves um, are related pretty closely to uh, what are called surface waves, and these are waves that only occur uh, where you have uh, the surface of the Earth. And um, so, here's a, a little cross section here. Uh, not easy to tell. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, we're looking uh, uh, down along this axis here and across the landscape over here. And uh, there are several kinds of surface waves, and two that we'll be uh, um, uh, talking about are uh, called Rayleigh waves and Love waves. They're both named after uh, British physicists from, uh, I think, uh, almost 200 years ago, or uh, more than 200 years ago. <clears throat> so uh, a Rayleigh wave uh, shakes both um, both uh, horizontally in the direction of propagation and vertically, okay, perpendicular to the direction of propagation. This is actually how you tell them apart, okay. So, um, uh, and it's important uh, that a Rayleigh wave uh, shakes in 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 both directions, okay. <coughs> um, now, the Rayleigh wave dies out uh, in um, uh, you know as you go down in depth. There's kind of a skin depth. And uh, you get deep enough, and the Rayleigh wave shaking is very small. Now, the shaking in both the uh, the horizontal and vertical direction actually makes these retrograde circles. These are are um, uh, ovals, uh, and you can see that for this one, there's more vertical shaking than horizontal shaking by a small factor. Okay, um, but um, uh, the shaking is is counterclockwise. You know, if the um, if the uh, propagation is to the right, okay, then the uh, the particles are moving counterclockwise. Actually, that's actually the same way that ocean waves, uh, you know, move uh, particles in the water. Okay, so the uh, the wave, of course, uh, until it breaks, it doesn't doesn't actually carry anything with it. Uh, you know, you can surf the wave uh, and move, you know, move with the wave, but that means you're not in the water. If you're in the water, then you're making this. Uh, this retrograde elliptical motion, okay, um, mostly up and down, but also partly back and forth, okay. So that's uh, 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 how the uh, Rayleigh wave uh, uh, shakes. Now, uh, if this material in here has a, and, and so we're not talking about ocean waves anymore, we're talking about Rayleigh waves. If the material has a shear velocity uh, value, okay, you know, which is going to be maybe half of the uh, of the p velocity. All right, then the Rayleigh wave propagates at a velocity that's a little bit slower. Okay, ninety percent of the shear wave velocity. So uh, you know, thinking about uh, different kinds of waves and how we distinguish them. Well, 
you know, the P waves propagate fastest. Okay, the uh, the S waves are at about half that velocity. And if we see a Rayleigh wave, it ought to be uh, at a lower velocity still. Okay, and we'll examine uh, Rayleigh wave uh, velocities in great detail in our in our second lab exercise, talking about refraction microtremor measurements. Okay, now the second kind of uh, of wave, named after the mathematician A. E. H. Love, um, is um, uh, only occurs uh, 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 when you have a, a slow surface layer. So you've got uh, Vs1, uh, which is smaller than Vs2. This happens all the time, right? Because we have uh, you know low velocity alluvium over high velocity bedrock. Okay, and that that's you know true of shear velocities as well. Okay, and the particle motion of love waves is is entirely um, entirely horizontal. So you can see love waves are like a surface wave that's made out of sh waves, okay. Whereas Rayleigh waves, which actually you know they don't require a low velocity surface layer, they they occur anywhere on the free surface, all right. Rayleigh waves, um, um, uh, let's see. So love waves um, um, uh, are uh, are shaking uh, uh, are like s sh waves, okay. Rayleigh waves are really made up of uh, uh, of SV waves, right? Because they're shaking vertically and in the direction of propagation. Okay, so love waves are more like SH waves, um, and uh, you know here we don't actually have the equipment appropriate for recording uh, love waves. Uh, we could try something, but uh, um, we don't we don't have the horizontal uh, geophones that are that are necessary to record love waves. But uh, the geophones we do have are very good, you know, because of the vertical shaking of Rayleigh waves. Our geophones are very, very good at recording uh, uh, Rayleigh waves. Okay, let me talk a little bit about uh, seismic sources. All right, uh, and they come in several categories: uh, passive and, and active. And there's several kinds of vibratory sources. Okay, uh, passive sources might include uh, earthquakes. Uh, which are are free, okay. Um, but you gotta you gotta wait around a long time, especially in Nevada. You gotta wait some time before an earthquake occurs that 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 you might record. So, um, you know, you put out your uh, your measure, measuring instruments, and then uh, um, you know maybe you really gotta make it a permanent installation to record earthquakes. And we've done quite a bit of exploration uh, of the structure of of Nevada with our permanent instruments, okay. That the size that the Nevada Seismic Lab maintains. So, um, you know, the, there are some advantages uh, to earthquakes aside from those uh, disadvantages. Um, you know, uh, uh, earthquakes happen at deep depths uh, that are are uh, uh, otherwise uh, inaccessible. You know, no way we can we can drill a, a charge into the uh, uh, you know the 15 kilometer depths that an earthquake might happen uh, at. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, as we're monitoring earthquakes uh, in Nevada and elsewhere, the uh, we can use them as as uh, passive sources to derive uh, uh, the structure of the Earth. Okay, <clears throat> and earthquakes are very high in energy, and and that's how we probe the structure of the entire Earth using earthquakes. Okay, now earthquakes uh, also, as a, another disadvantage, they also um, um, radiate uh, lots of low frequency. Uh, so, so definition may not be very good, and uh, also lots of S waves, okay, uh, which may makes things. Uh, you know, we, we really have to take advantage of those S waves and not try too hard to interpret the P waves from earthquakes. Uh, there's another source that I added in here uh, uh, more recently, and that's microtremor noise. Okay, there's a lot of microtremor noise in urban areas, and what it tends to be. Is uh, Rayleigh waves uh, generated by vehicles hitting cracks in the road? Okay, so a vehicle drives over a joint in the uh, in the pavement, and um, uh, there'll be a little impact of the tires against the uh, far side of the joint, and that uh, creates a seismic source that radiates uh, a lot of Rayleigh waves. Okay, uh, you know this process, uh, uh, you know, makes for some pretty incoherent uh, noise, and there's uh, you know, looking at a busy roadway, right? The uh, uh, the uh, 
the noise is uh, coming from every different direction, and it's coming at all sorts of different velocities and different amplitudes. So it's uh, it, it can be quite hard to figure out, uh, you know, um, and uh, and you know to isolate one wave and to time it is almost impossible. So uh, that's what my uh, refraction microtremor technique does: is it makes the analysis easy. And in lab two, you'll you'll see all that. Uh, okay, let's go to the uh, active sources. Okay, there's the uh, vibratory sources. Uh, there's a um, the patented uh, by Conoco patent uh, on uh, what's called vibro size. Um, advantages: high re highly repeatable, highly linear. You know, it doesn't cause a lot of deformation of the ground underneath the, the vibrator truck. Um, it's uh, it's inexpensive, and and uh, uh, that's how you know that's how you do. Tens of thousands of shot points for modern uh, industrial surveys. Okay, uh, you need tens of thousands, maybe millions of shot points. There's control on the frequency. Uh, you can get, uh, you know, one, 10 to 200 hertz uh, very easily. You can see uh, reflectors as deep as as all the way through the crust at the Moho Rovacic uh, discontinuity. The Moho. Um, you know, you can't do vibra size without some extra processing. Uh, but that's uh, really built into everything now, and it's it's not a problem. Um, the real problem with fiber size is that these trucks cost about a half million dollars, at least, and um, uh, there's only so many of them around, and they're all being used right now for oil exploration. Um, you know, we just had a giant uh, 3D fiber size survey uh, in Alco County um, late last year. A uh, couple they. Uh, you know, they surveyed uh, probably about 70 square miles um, and used uh, tens, if not hundreds of thousands, of uh, fiber size points over a couple of months. Okay, so uh, you know these are these are very expensive uh, facilities uh, that people are willing to pay a lot to, to use. So you know, scheduling it, mobilizing it, you know, getting the the vibrator truck uh, low buoyed out to your uh, survey location. That can be eighty thousand uh, uh, dollars just for one vibrator truck. So uh, really, uh, uh, quite a quite an expensive proposition. You you've got to have a lot of work to do to justify a vibro size truck. Uh, there used to be this uh, uh, use, uh, um, and the French are very good at, at coming up with the, the best names. Mini Soci, uh, which is really just a line of pavement whackers. And so some of my colleagues in the U.S. Geological Survey have spent significant time. I think that they'd prefer not to talk about uh, holding these pavement whackers and um, um, you know walking in, in very slowly in lines, uh, you know, with these pavement whackers uh, jolting their hands, um, and that's uh, kind of a, a cheater's uh, vibra size, right? It doesn't cost much to rent a pavement whacker, and they're pretty pretty available. Uh, but there is only one crew. Um, anymore in the in the United States, and I, I don't know if the USGS has fielded many SOCI in some time. Um, you know, they have a, a contract with uh, the University of Texas at Austin to use their their mini vibe uh, instead. So, um, uh, you know, this there may be a couple of crews uh, left in uh, uh, around the world, but uh, I haven't seen any any work done with mini SOCI in quite some time. Now there are also marine and borehole vibrators uh, that go up into you know well into the kilohertz range, and um, uh, one thing I, I I'd like to mention is uh, uh, Graham Kent uh, in our uh, in the Seismolab has access to uh, what's called the uh, the marine chirp device, and uh, that has uh, that chirp device has revolutionized uh, our uh, our view of uh, the lake bottoms, uh, and it's uh, the chirp device uh, helped uh, a uh, you know one master's graduate here last year uh, uh, helped Amy Ices to map the hundreds of faults that are at the bottom of Pyramid Lake. The chirp device also helped uh, um, our uh, our PhD student Gretchen Schmauter to realize that there are only three faults at the bottom of Lake Tahoe. All right, so. Uh, uh, we have now, uh, you know, sort of opened a new age in uh, in marine uh, vibrators, okay, uh, which are providing some incredible uh, geologic data. Uh, explosive sources, okay, um, there uh, you can put explosives in a shot hole. 
you can get good energy, you get high frequency, you can put the uh, source you know, into the water table and below that soft sand that absorbs energy so, so uh, readily. Okay, They're pretty repeatable. There's fewer S waves, there's fewer air waves. Um, the trouble is, uh, you know, you got to get a permit for all that drilling. Okay, you got to, you know, uh, my favorite driller, uh, uh, Mike Tyler, down in uh, Carson City. You know, he's got to charge about uh, three thousand dollars a day for drilling and blasting. All right. Um, there's this problem of the nonlinear, um, uh, you know, point source. So, uh, you know, uh, Mike can only drill. Um, so many holes in in one day, and uh, so uh, uh, you know we're kind of limited, all right. Um, and uh, you know you and I, uh, you know we just don't have the uh, permits uh, and the certifications to be able to do blasting. Um, you know, well maybe some of you guys do, okay. Uh, but you know how much trouble it is to maintain those certifications and permits, and how expensive that is. All right. Uh, now, if you do have a, a blaster's permit, you can, um, you know, uh, just string uh, a primer cord or uh, or uh, uh, hang uh, uh, bags of explosive on uh, on lath. Uh, you know, maybe uh, six feet in the air, uh, and it's very linear. You get very high frequency. Um, uh, it makes a heck of a noise. Okay, so you can only do it in remote areas. Right? There's a giant air wave, of course. Um, and uh, uh, but it is pretty uh, uh, pretty linear, uh, so um, you know that's a that's a reasonable thing in a, in in remote areas. Um, uh, also, many of my good colleagues have developed techniques where they basically aim a eight gauge shotgun at the uh, at the ground. Uh, that can be very portable, very repeatable. Uh, it makes a heck of a mess, um, and if you use the wrong loads, then um, um, you uh, you know you're going to be shooting uh, pieces of lead into the ground, which uh, you know the highway department or or the people whose land you're on may not like once they realize what you're doing. Uh, this is uh, probably the highest energy way of getting really high frequencies, uh, but the energy is not that great. Uh, you know when I've tried uh, shotgun surveys, um, you know I really wasn't able to to see down more than 50 meters. Um, and um, you know, it took ten shells, which cost like two dollars each, you know, to do what uh, what ten sledgehammer hits could do. So, you know, I'm not uh, uh, not not too fond of the shotgun method. Uh, very time consuming. So, uh, you know, uh, with uh, um, uh, in in uh, uh, relatively harder sediments, uh, it, it could be quite uh, quite uh, effective. There's also a marine. Uh, uh, Explosion source called a sparker, uh, very high frequency. Um, it was used, uh, you know, to great effect for very quick surveys in lakes and and seas uh, uh, many years ago. But it's not; it's much lower energy than uh, uh, than the the chirp device. So uh, the chirp has really taken over where the sparker used to used to have. Uh, impact sources. Okay, uh, there's a bizarre device uh, uh, called the land air gun. Enough said about that. Uh, weight drops are very popular, um, you know. But you gotta, you have a, like a five-ton trailer. You gotta tow, um, or or you hang a, a one-ton um, uh, device off the trailer hitch of your of your truck. You gotta have a pretty big truck, so it's really a road. Uh, it's it's road road usable only. Okay, uh, and and you know as you're lifting and dropping the weight, uh, you know maybe seventy-five kilograms, uh, maybe less. Um, you know the the frame of the thing is under constant stress, so um, uh, the more complex ones, the more expensive ones uh, need need constant fixing. Uh, you know, finally, my colleagues at uh, Boise State, Lee Liberty, he developed a uh, a weight drop. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, it's twenty or thirty kilograms, um, and it's an enhanced weight drop. Um, but uh, you know. It actually works, and it's not too hard to fix. It's so simple; it's uh, it's easy to fix. So uh, you know, there's uh, uh, that that one is cheap enough. Uh, Lee Liberties is cheap enough. Okay, uh, there are uh, a lot of S waves. There's a lot of interference from the surface, uh, but you don't have to do any permitting. It's repeatable. 
and uh, you know, with uh, with Lee Liberty's weight drop, we could see down a kilometer. So uh, it's a fantastic source, and uh, you know, really the only cost is 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 paying him and, and his students to bring it down, you know, and, and operate it or teach us to operate it. So that's it has a cost, but it's it's pretty low. All right, what you guys are going to do is the least cost uh, um, uh, seismic source, which is the sledgehammer. And uh, we have a 16-pound sledge, so that's uh, seven kilograms. Okay, um, it's obviously most portable. It's it's if you do it right, it's quite repeatable, um, and it's uh, it's inexpensive so long as you guys hammer safely. Okay, um, you know, so there can be workman's comp issues. Uh, so we'll make sure that everybody is uh, is is trained and has some practice to uh, use the sledge. Okay, because we're going to use it during our spring break field exercises. All right, so um, you know those of you who've never handled a sledge, um, you know, build up your upper bodies and uh, be ready because uh, we're not going to let anybody off the hook. All right, uh, I want everybody to try, um, and uh, you know, if you're too weak to handle the sledge, I won't let you because you'll just hurt yourself. But uh, uh, you better be prepared to uh, to make. Uh, uh, to make up the, uh, uh, you know, for the extra work that your your partners are going to have to do, so um, it's um, uh, it's something to aspire to. All right, um, you know, even uh, and it doesn't matter, you know, so long as you're able to safely lift the the hammerhead over your head and uh, and then bring it, uh, you know, with some slight control down onto the uh, the striker plate. Uh, you know, basically an inch-thick steel plate that we use. Uh, you know, without hurting yourself, then um, uh, you can you can make just as good of uh, of a source as uh, you know as a football player who's uh, um, uh, you know who's very strong already. Okay, so so the emphasis is not on brute strength; it's on it's on control and it's on. Uh, 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 you know, safe use of the of the sledgehammer. Okay. Um, you know, you get a lot of S waves. Uh, the source is right on the surface. You get a lot of air waves. Um, but we should be able to profile to uh, 100 meters depth. And um, at least, you know, when you're not uh, doing sledgehammer surveys down a city street, there's no permitting required. Okay. And it's pretty high frequency. So it's really my uh, my my instrument of choice. Okay, seismic source of choice. So, in planning your survey, okay, you've got to consider the material, the labor, the service costs of not just one source, but but you know hundreds, if not thousands, of sources. All right, and uh, you know, in a in an average uh, reflection survey that we'll do, that takes at least five hundred impacts of the of the sledgehammer. All right. So you know, one person is obviously not going to do that. Um, you know, we 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 do have people in this class who are known to be able to work. You know, use a sledgehammer very effectively, um, and you can probably look around and 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 tell who they are. But um, uh, uh, we're going to spread the load. Okay, those 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 guys are, uh, and they do tend to be guys. Uh, not necessarily, actually, but. Uh, um, they uh, they do tend um, the uh, uh, those those people are uh, uh, are not going to have to take the whole load. Okay, we're all going to help them, even me. All right, um, and I'm you know I'm a lot older than you guys, so uh, uh, I I shouldn't do too much hammering, but I'll do some hammering. Okay, got to got to all help out. Okay, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, sizing recorders. All right. Um, the um, uh, here's kind of a, a diagram of uh, what we typically would have. Um, we'll uh, the first thing we'll do when we start a seismic survey is we'll lay out a cable, and that cable will have um, 24 or 48 places where we can, uh, or maybe just 12. We'll have some number of places where we can connect um, some sensors. Okay. And uh, that's called a takeout. Those connections. So there'll be uh, 12 to 48 uh, connections that we can make. All right. 
uh, 12 to 48 takeouts. And those will be spaced evenly across the ground along our seismic survey line. And then um, there's a, uh, a sensor called a jug, which is basically a little can with a spike at the bottom, four inches long. And we set that jug into the ground. And, the, uh, uh, and there may be more than one jug per takeout. What that means is that the, uh, these uh, multiple sensors, okay, when we use them, the multiple sensors, you know, their signals get summed electrically. They're connected in, uh, in parallel, I think, is the ones that I have. And uh, so they get elect their signals get averaged just electrically, and uh, that goes into the, into the takeout. Okay, from each takeout, the amplifier amplifies that channel. Right, each takeout is connected to one channel of the amplifier. Uh, there could be some filtering, uh, and then there's uh, uh, some uh, amp uh, um, uh, there is analog to digital conversion, A to D. Okay. And then there's this uh, uh, concept of a stacker. Okay, the digital the digital record is put on the screen for you to see, and uh, at every point, okay, uh, at the same time after the trigger, right? The uh, here's the, uh, the little sledgehammer, and uh, uh, when the sledgehammer hits the plate, that triggers the recorder to to start, and um, and so it fills the memory with that uh, that particular. Um, you know that particular uh, uh, the the sensing from that particular hit. Now uh, the recorder also adds adds up the records. You know that the same the same channel the same time. You know down to the the microsecond. Okay, it adds in the amplitude of all the previous hits. Okay, and then when you've when you've hit the sledgehammer ten times is what probably what we'll use uh, at the uh, at the source point. Then the um, you say you call the record good, and you store it on the uh, the hard drive of the recorder, okay. And then we bring it out of the recorder, um, and we uh, we process it. Um, and and uh, our third lab uh, on uh, uh, well, there's some processing uh, in the first lab on refraction. There's processing on the second lab on refraction microtremor, and there's processing in the uh, and interpretation in the uh, uh, the third lab on seismic reflection. Okay, and we'll do all those things uh, for our, our field exercises as well. Okay, now what are these jugs? These uh, uh, these sensors. All right, these are uh, they're called uh, geophones. Uh, they're basically large phonograph cartridges. All right, um, I don't know if any of you remember uh, uh, have even heard of a phonograph cartridge. Um, in uh, uh, there's really no parallel in, in current technology because uh, uh, I used to be able to say that geophones are very much like the uh, displacement sensors, uh, the velocity sensors on the arms of the uh, uh, that that hold the lens in in a in a CD reader, okay, uh, you know, with a spinning uh, uh, compact disc. Uh, we don't even use those m uh, much anymore. So, um, you know, unlike uh, unlike music now, there's no you know, music is all done uh, 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 without any mechanical uh, interface at all. Uh, it's done entirely uh, with uh, you know flash RAM and and uh, um, maybe uh, uh, maybe one way to uh, to express it is that a uh, a geophone is like a reverse speaker. Okay, with a speaker, you you know your music generates uh, a voltage, and that voltage uh, uh, causes a current to flow through this uh, wire. Um, this coil, and in the middle of the coil is a magnet, and so when there's a jolt of voltage, then you get a jolt of motion of the magnet, and um, and that's what uh, uh, you know. It's that that jolt moves the jolt of the magnet moves the speaker cone, and uh, then you hear something. Okay, same thing happens at much smaller scale inside headphones. Okay, uh, but um, uh, the geophone is 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 the reverse. Okay. You've got a uh, uh, you've got a, a a magnet which is spiked into the ground. Okay, inside the plastic case, it's a magnet spiked into the ground, and and hanging around it, uh, off a leaf spring, is a uh, is is the coil. Okay, and the coil is very light, so there's a lot of uh, sensitivity, and the coil is what's inertial because it's hanging off a spring. Okay. So when the ground moves, okay, the coil is inertial, so it stays in place. The 
the, the magnet moves, and the magnet moves against the coil, which is staying in place. And so um, the moving magnet against the inside the coil of wire generates a voltage. And basically, each channel of the seismometer is a voltmeter that keeps track of the voltage with respect to time. Okay, and that's our recording. And uh, if we calibrated it, we could we could get back to the voltage. We could get back to uh, we could calibrate the whole system and and actually get back to the uh, um, the uh, the actual uh, velocity of the ground motion. Uh, we don't we don't bother. We look at relative amplitudes and we look at relative arrival times. All right. Uh, of of waves noticed by these uh, these geophones. Okay, now uh, this system of uh, of the inertial spring of the inertial coil hanging from a spring results in um, two characteristics. There's a little shunt resistor in there that uh, allows the uh, you know the circuit to complete, right? Um, so depending on the stiffness of the spring. There's a uh, F0, a natural frequency of the geophone. And depending on the size of the shunt resistor, the resistance of the shunt resistor, there's a damping coefficient, h, which is the percent of critical damping. Okay. So uh, here's a spectrum that shows you the spectral response of, of your average uh, moving coil geophone. Okay. And, and it's really the same in the inverse for speakers. Okay. So um, if you have low damping, all right. So let's say the, the it's only um, twenty percent of, of critical damping, okay? Then uh, it's going to be very very sensitive uh, right at uh, the the uh, the natural frequency of the geophone f zero, but that sensitivity is going to fall off, okay, at higher frequencies, and then uh, you know even if whether you use critical damping or 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 low damping, even with high damping, the sensitivity fall off at lower frequencies is really sharp. Okay, so you kind of get this plateau, which for the geophones we'll use is maybe between eight hertz and uh, five hundred hertz. Okay, it's uh, fairly well plateaued. Um, you know, if you look at uh, half of the natural frequency, you're down maybe uh, fifty decibels. Uh, you know, which is a very small response, but still maybe enough to see something. Okay, so we'll see that, especially when we look at our uh, Remy records, um, refraction microtremor records. But uh, uh, it's really, it's really, uh, you know, these geophones are designed uh, with this seventy percent of critical damping to have a flat response between the uh, the natural frequency and uh, many times the natural frequency. You know, like uh, ours are are at least uh, fifty times the natural frequency. So they re record a pretty broad spectrum of waves. Okay. Now, why do we want to have this sensitivity, you know, over a broad range? Well. Um, that's because the the bandwidth of the waves we can get through the ground is is going to be is going to be limited. All right, you know our source uh, may be high frequency, uh, but it um, uh, it's going to tail off. You know it's going to tail off at low frequencies. It's going to tail off at uh, high at, at very high frequencies. Uh, and the real problem is the the response of the ground uh, tails off very fast. Why is that? Remember that Q factor? Okay. That I introduced you to earlier in this lecture, um, you know that uh, that absorption is very severe at higher frequencies. Okay, and so you know the ground response is pretty good at low frequencies, but it, it tails off very severely at higher frequencies. So you take this spectrum, you multiply it by the ground response, you know, which is just going to leave the lower frequencies. You multiply it by the geophone response, which is cut off, you know, pretty severely below the the natural frequency of the geophone. And it's going to be cut off also uh, uh, at very, very, very high frequencies. And what you get is a narrow bandwidth. Okay, you get kind of a narrow hump uh, that you're you're recording it. And you'll see that in the uh, the data that we get and the data that the the data sets that we look at. Okay. So uh, what 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 limits our band? The low frequency limits uh, of the geophone uh, uh, natural frequencies. And the high frequencies are limited by the uh, uh, by the source. You know what are the frequencies we're putting in with the source, and also by Q. Okay, which means the further away we are, the less high frequency we get. All right. So a high frequency uh, a, a, a seismogram at large distance, you know, from our active source, you know, could be really narrow band, maybe and maybe hardly anything at all. 
Okay. Now uh, we use a process of filtering. Uh, you know, usually in displaying the data, um, you might uh, need to. Uh, uh, if there's a lot of high frequency noise in the area, you might need to do uh, some filtering before analog to digital conversion, and so the instrument has to do that. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, depending on on uh, how uh, how often you sample your delta t, okay, we we might sample at uh, uh, at uh, 500 uh, uh, microseconds, uh, or uh, you know one millisecond, which would be uh, you know half as often. Um, the Nyquist frequency, the the frequency that uh, uh, that's the highest frequency that is represented in data, and you can see that's half of the sampling frequency. Okay, the sampling frequency is one over the the sample interval. Okay, in seconds, so it'll be in hertz, and you take half of that, divide by two here, and uh, and you get the Nyquist frequency. That's the highest frequency that you'll see in your data. If you see any frequencies above the Nyquist frequency, it's a total um, numerical uh, artifact. All right. Uh, we might we might want to apply a, a notch filter. Okay. There's AP, AC power everywhere, at least in this country, um, and well everywhere now. Uh, even out in the wilds of Nevada, there'll be a power line somewhere in the valley, and we'll see it. Okay, we'll see that 60 hertz uh, power. If you're in New Zealand or Australia, it's at 50 hertz. Okay, and uh, uh, if you can kill it before analog to digital conversion, that can help. But uh, uh, we may uh, we may just record it and um, uh, the data that we get, and uh, and try to kill it. Try to put in a notch filter afterwards. Okay, the uh, uh, um, usually, the uh, the filters, low pass filter, high pass filter, band pass filter, you know, we we only apply the the filters in later processing. Okay, and so we try to we try to pass you know frequencies that are higher than the Rayleigh waves because they tend to be low frequency, uh, and frequencies that are that are lower than the frequency than the high frequencies of the air wave. Okay, so uh, you know that's that's just trying to eliminate some of the Things that that we consider noise, at least in reflection refraction um, surveying. Okay, some pointers. All right. Um, you know, if you need high resolution and you um, you need uh, uh, you need high frequencies, then uh, uh, you've got to you've got to keep your Nyquist frequency uh, uh, way above the frequencies you need. You know, by a factor of two to four. All right. So if you want 100 hertz data, okay, um, then uh, uh, you um, you know you need you need those high frequencies for the definition you want. Then uh, you've got to you've got to use a Nyquist frequency of at least 200 hertz, which means you got to have a sampling frequency of above 400 hertz. You know, and 500 hertz would be uh, would be pretty easy to do. So uh, that's that's a, a guideline. Okay. Uh, and that that's simple to do with with modern instruments. Now, be prepared to spend substantial time testing your instrument and survey parameters, testing your time sampling, test, testing. You know, this T here stands in for the total time of recording. Are you recording enough time to get all the reflections you want, or or to see refractions out at the distances you want? Okay, uh, are you recording enough time to uh, see all the Rayleigh waves you want? Okay. Um, you uh, uh, you know can you see uh, can you, you need to trial different filters you know when you look at the data uh, you need to do uh, different numbers of stacks in other words uh, you need to hit the ground uh, you know ten times at uh, at your uh, at each source point and if you're not getting good enough data maybe you need to you need to notice that and try hitting it twenty times at each source point or maybe you're getting really good data. And uh, uh, you only need to hit it five times at each source point. You know, no no reason to waste the effort. Really critical is uh, delta x. That's how far apart do you set the geophones, okay? Uh, and then what's the maximum distance between the source and a geophone? All right, are, are, is it so far? Is x max so far that you're just recording nothing but noise? You know, all the all the waves from your source have died out over half your half your channels, uh, or or are you um, uh, uh, you know, are you only recording uh, 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 close enough 
that uh, you're not seeing any of the refractions. Okay, so this that's a, a really critical parameter. And then uh, typically you have a, a certain number of channels that you're using, and so then you set x max according to your experiment and what you want to get out of it. And then delta x is kind of set for you because you only have so many channels. And uh, but that delta x is going to have certain ramifications. So you've got to spend a lot of time, you know, trying things. You know. Uh, setting out your line, recording some data, hitting the sledgehammer, and if it doesn't work, okay, we got to reconfigure, we got to rethink this, okay? We'll do that in the field, all right, over spring break. Um, you've got to, uh, you know, watch as a survey goes on, and, you know, are your records changing? Did your quality suddenly deteriorate? Okay, you have to reevaluate, retest, and, you know, redo your survey parameters. Uh, uh, as the survey progresses and, and conditions are going to change, okay, you might be surveying one day and it's uh, um, it, it recently rained and uh, you're getting good data, uh, and you come back the next day and it's all dried out and uh, uh, you're not getting nearly as good a data. So you got to change your change your setup, okay. Uh, now when you're uh, looking at bids for seismic surveys, uh, you got to realize that. Um, um, there are two ways to do um, uh, to do contracts for a seismic survey, and I expect that all of you are uh, at one time or another you're going to be you know setting out a seismic survey to bid, and you're going to be evaluating the the proposals that come back. Okay, some of those proposals, or you might ask for per hour contracts. Okay, that gives you uh, that gives you total control. You can do all the testing you want. That means, of course, that your data is going to be expensive. All right. So you know you may if if this is your first survey in a totally new area with a totally new situation, totally new objective, you may need to to invest that that extra money and do a per hour contract. Okay. Um, on the other hand, um, if you uh, uh, if you have a per mile contract uh, or per day contract uh, uh, or or not per day but uh, um, you know per kilometer contract, then uh, um, you're at the risk of getting lousy, uh, lousy data. You'll get you'll get it cheap, uh, but it'll be lousy. Okay, so um, uh, you'll probably end up. You know, once you're you're in, uh, you know, you you've got a, a standard uh, objective, and you have um, uh, you know you know how it's to be surveyed. You can let a per mile contract, but you've got to have some controls in there. About uh, the quality of the data that that the the contractor promises, okay, and and you've got to be out there and you've got to bird dog that contractor and you've got to notice when the when the quality goes away and you got to say hey you know you're uh, you're not living up to your contract here you got to stop you got to redo it you got to rethink it you know how are we going to do this better and uh, it's not easy to make a contractor stop but uh, and that's why your uh, you got to write your contracts very carefully to make sure that you can. All right. So uh, you know, my advice is once you you you're you're used to doing a, a survey, you know, make that go ahead and make that per mile contract, but uh, make sure there's some controls in that contract, some clauses that uh, guarantee a certain quality of data. All right. You'll pay a little bit more. Um, you know, the contractor's not going to do that at their rock bottom price, uh, but um, You'll have uh, uh, you'll have much better data, and um, you know you should learn everything in this class, uh, and you should learn enough in this class so that you can effectively uh, bird dog your contractor and uh, make sure that the result that you deliver to your client is uh, is the best. Okay. Next time. Um, uh, we're going to go into uh, the uh, one particular kind of. Uh, of uh, uh, seismic survey, which is the seismic reflection survey. And this is the end of the uh, two lectures on uh, seismic principles.